A mega synagogue is 10 men. That's right. <laughs> 10 men make up a congregation. 10 men make up a, a quorum, if you will. And uh, it's interesting because in as much as we would love to have, you know, large congregations, synagogues full of people, which is, you know, we want to have that. It's interesting because uh, just as a side note, a, a lot of times Orthodox synagogues tend to be uh, smaller than when we what we think of in other religious settings. You know, in other religious settings, you have what they call, you know, mega churches. There's there's 10,000 people. There's 5,000 people. There's, you know, a thousand people in each service or something like that. It's interesting to me because uh, just looking at it spiritually on the Orthodox side of things, sometimes it's hard to gather a minion. I'm talking about in an Orthodox community where there are Orthodox Jews who live blocks away from the synagogue. Sometimes it's hard to even form a minion for various, from various reasons. Uh, sometimes it's hard to gather people into the Orthodox world because... Frankly, it requires, you know, responsibility or something beyond just having faith. Anybody can say they have faith. That's fairly easy because there's really no proverbial proof because there's no put, pudding. Um, and it, it reminds me of the idea that, you know, the way of righteousness is narrow and few find it the way of, of uh, uh, sin, you know, is broad. And so, whereas, you know, I would love to say we had a, we have a full house and when we will, don't, don't get me wrong. And we, that, that will be the case, but we also have to scratch our, our heads and say, you know, uh, having 5,000 people, 10,000 people in a building, uh, is, is that the broad way or is that the narrow way? I, I don't know, but Hey, it's just a, just a food for thought. But the reality is, is that 10 men in Judaism, can sit, can constitute a congregation. And interestingly, this comes from the, the 10 spies, uh, because this congregation of men, this these 10 men, <clears throat> really turned an entire nation uh, to evil and, and led them on a disastrous path. It also teaches us another valuable lesson. What, what can we do how much power does just 10 men have? You know, one of the things I love about Judaism, by the way, um, well, there's several things. There's lots of things I love about Judaism, but let me just deal with a couple of things. First of all, good morning. Glad you're here. Uh, welcome. Please be sure and like this video, share it with all of your friends, subscribe to our channel if you've not done so. That would be uh, fantastic. So, uh, and, and by the way, hit the little bell icon. That's another thing that needs to be said because if you that little there's a little bell icon I want you to subscribe. I think it says all or something. That way you get notified for everything that we do here. So Judaism really honors men and women. Uh, but unlike a lot of religions uh, that kind of treat women as 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 um, uh, Chattel, meaning property. Uh, Judaism has never done that. Not even in ancient times, women were not treated like property. Uh, they were protected. They were guarded. Uh, at the same time, Judaism makes a distinction between the two sexes. Um, men and women have equal value, but they're not equal. Uh, meaning in, in in our roles and so forth. You know, men can't have babies. That's just science. Um, women can. That's also science. And, uh, you know, men men have different chromosomes. There's an XY. Women have XX. Um, that's just science. You know, you can't be a man if you have XX chromosomes and you can't be, you know, that's just, that's just science. You just, you can't, there's some things you can't change. Um so Judaism has always made a distinction between these the sexes, um, but at the same time maintained that uh, 
that value between the two. They're, they're, and, and so, you know, there's lots of things we can say, and I've talked about it extensively in times past about this point. Now, but looking at the men's side of things, one of the th great things about Judaism is that um, a lot of responsibility is put on men. And, and, and I, I think believe from, from a, uh, a divine point of view, that is, that is no accident. We've said before that, um, you know, the reason that men wear seat seat and wrapped felon and have other uh, obligations like that, that women typically don't have, uh, as far as mandated is because women are Judaism recognizes that women are naturally more spiritual. Uh, men need a little bit more reminding in that department. Um, and that's, that's true. There, there's, it's, and so the men have the responsibility to stand up and read from the Bema. Uh, men have the responsibility to form the minion. Women are not, are not counted in the minion. Women are not supposed to be congregational leaders. Uh, women are not supposed to be rabbis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are all men oriented functions uh, because again, it's the two, it's, it's the distinction between the two sexes. It doesn't mean that women don't have value. It's just that there's, there's reasons for this. What's interesting though, from just a, a man's point of view, and this is my opinion and some men may agree with me, but, um, uh, uh, men are driven by do in, in, in part by duty and responsibility. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just like a guy thing. It's like, it's like a man is driven to uh, protect and for protection for, uh, you know, uh, pr provision that's how men are kind of drawn in, in, in part is that we have we 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 respond to duty. We respond to responsibility. Therefore, you know, it's like the man up thing It's like you 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 need to be here because you need to be part of the minion and, and you need to read from the Bema and you need to be, you know, you need you have responsibilities such as, you know, uh, as I said, reading from the Bema or rapid the feeling or or being the man, being the leader, you know, men, I think from, from, from when we were little boys, we respond to that. It's time to man up. It's time to take your place. And a lot of times what happens in false religions, you'll notice that they're very women driven again, nothing wrong with women. All right. They, women are valuable. They're, they, they they have their very important place. A rabbi was once quoted uh, when, when the, the, some of the young men of the congregation, because I think it was Yom Kippur coming, I believe it was, and they wanted to get rid of the women's section because they knew that there would be an influx of men coming for the Yom Kippur holiday or what have you. And in order to make room in the synagogue, an idea was thrown up that we should get rid of the women's section, uh, that would open up a lot more seating. And the rabbi rebuked them and said, no. Because without the women there, there won't be any spirit in the praying. Um, and so, you know, listen, women have a very valuable place. But you'll notice in these false religions, I'm talking about all false religions, the, all of them, <clears throat> that even the pagan ones, that a lot of times it was women who were the priestesses and it, the gods were goddesses. And, and the men end up becoming, you know, emasculated, the gildings. And so this would have this is what happens when women are, you know, kind of take these responsibilities and men, they kind of drift off. They kind of drift away. And the reason is because men respond to responsibility, responsibility. You talk to a man and you're serious. It's, it's true. You say, man, listen, we need you. We need you in the fight. We need you to man up. We need you to become a part of the minion. And, and, and men just. We light up like, yeah, I need time. I need to storm the beach. It's my, it's, that's my deal, you know. And uh, women may or may not understand that, but that's just how men operate. So we're talking about the minion, you know, talking about men coming together to form a congregation. This is all about the responsibility. And I believe that that's all part of God's ultimate plan. That this is what re this is what men respond to. We we respond to doing things.
you know, you know how it is, ladies. You're, you're talking to your husband and you you're just sharing your woes. And the man, what does the man do? The man he listens to your woes for a few minutes and then immediately starts giving you a plan of action. You don't want a plan of action. You just want him to listen to your 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 sad story. That's the difference between men and women. Men are men of action. Therefore, when you tell a man you've got a problem, he immediately starts to try to fix it. Um, women sometimes don't want him to fix it. Women sometimes just want him to listen and and, and sympathize and empathize, and that's fine. The, the two sexes have their have their way about them. That's no problem. But just understand that men do things, and so you tell a man, "Listen, I need you to I need you to bear down and start to learn Hebrew or whatever, or 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 go through the go through the proper uh, processes by which you have the eligibility." to join the minion and, and, you know, read from the Bema, carry the Torah scroll, that type of thing. Um, and all men respond to that. Like, yeah, I need to check that box because that's what I do. Do you agree with me guys? Am I, am I saying, uh, am I saying, am I being correct here? I'm just asking. <clears throat> women does Hashem never give women the ability to teach. My wife teaches on this channel. But can she lead the congregation? No. Um, so women teach other women for sure. Um, but is, is she, is she called, can women lead, like be the leaders of the entire congregation? No, they can't. Um, doesn't mean they don't have the ability to teach. It's just, it's a, listen, it's a role thing. It's important that we keep roles. Um, so the only time that you see women in leadership, like there's one experience, there's Deborah, right? Who was the, the prophetess. That was during the time of the judges. And people say, see, that's a good example. No, it's not a good example. Because at that time, people were, um, there was a lack of leadership. And so Deborah took that role because no man would man up and do it. That's sad. In fact, when it came time to go into battle, Deborah tried to tell the guy, Barach, um, you need to go man up and lead this fight. Don't don't take me along with you. That's that's not a good thing for a woman to be in in the in the lead. Deborah said that to Barach, but he wasn't man enough. So it's no, it's not a good example. It only happens when there isn't anybody else. And that's not a good thing. Kind of like lighting candles. Can a man, can who lights the candles? The woman. Um, can a man light candles or, or and or make holla? Yes, when there's no woman present. But if a, if let's say you have a single man and you know he's obviously not married, so can he, should he light candles on, on Friday night? Yes, absolutely. However, let's suppose that the single man is in his house. He lights the candles every single Friday night because he's not married. But yet, let's just say hypothetically that his sister and brother-in-law come over for Friday night. He should absolutely ask his sister to light the candles. You see, there's roles, right? That's the point. So coming back to this story of the minion. So the 10 spies are the evil spies who, who, com who commit. And, and by the way, let me just say this before I get onto the spy thing. Sometimes Some of what I just said may shock the senses, but you have to understand something that Judaism is not always, and in fact, rarely is in alignment with pop culture. Because pop culture is not driven by Torah, okay? You and I, as Jews, Lapid Jews, you and I have to be driven by Torah, not by pop culture. I have found in my life and my walk that very often the way of the world is in direct opposition to the way of Torah. We may wonder, which is right? Torah, why? Because God created the world. And that's his handbook. So we have the 10 spies. They have gone about creating a mess. Um, 
I'm going to pick up the reading in the fourth reading of the Kehol Tumash. We've been reading from the Kehol Tumash just because it provides a lot of backstory to us. This is from chapter 14, uh, beginning in verse 26 is where the fourth um, uh, the fourth reading happens. It says, having finished discussing the fate of the people in general, God spoke to Moses, instructing him to convey his words to Aaron about the fate of the spies themselves saying, how much longer must I tolerate this evil congregation of spies? So here, <clears throat> the reason why 10 men became a congregation in Judaism is because God calls it so. Hashem refers to the 10 men as a congregation. So this evil congregation of spies who are causing everyone else to complain against me, I have heard the Israelites' complaints that the spies make them voice against me. Since your argument about what the other nations will say does not apply here, I have to kill them immediately. Yikes. Boy, we don't want to be the instigators of uh, rebellion, do we? This happens a lot. You know, I, I've, I, uh, I've heard this, you know, in uh, pastor friends of mine, particularly, who, you know, uh, somebody will get sideways in their congregation for whatever reason. And, and, and you know, it's it just it's it's a part it's a part of the, of the deal. And then they'll go around and, and they, you know, people that get sideways, they, they rarely just leave. Like, you know what, guys, we're out. You know, we don't like it here for whatever reason. And we're, we're gone. So, you know, they, they tell me. Um, they'll say, no, no, they didn't just leave. They went around and they, they voiced their complaint to everybody. Uh, and then a lot of people kind of took up their offense and left with them. Uh, why do people do that? Well, because, you know, it, uh, what is it? Misery likes company. That's 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 why. So it says, so now say first to the Israelites what their fate is to be. I swear that as surely as I live, says God, if I do not do to you just as you have spoken in my ears, it will be as if I do not live. So Hashem is not exactly thrilled with these people. Says your corpses will fall in the in this desert just as you wished. All of you who are counted in a tally of those 20 years and up, everyone except those under 20, the Levites who are counted from the age of one month or 30 years, and the women and the mixed multitude who are not counted will perish because you complained against me. Okay. So everybody who is 20 years and up, okay, will perish. Now, it's interesting here because in this insight of the of the K.O. Tumash, reading it carefully, it says, all of you who are counted in any tally of those who are 20 years old and up. Now, let, let me pause here and talk just a brief second about due process in Judaism because I always, always, always love to bring this up. Because um, a lot of times people <clears throat> from the Roman faith that was, um, you know, created in the fourth century, they teach that the, one of the reasons why JC had to come and get rid of that rascally old Torah that belonged that uh, that old God in the Old Testament is because, man, back in those days, whoo, boy, if you broke any, even one of the, the Torah laws, Man, you could just be minding your own business and accidentally break a tour law, and then they would grab you by the nap of the neck, drag you outside the little town there, and just stone you right to death. Um, and then and don't forget, don't forget if you're if little Johnny uh happened to back talk mama boy, daddy would grab him by the back of his hair and just stone him to pieces yeah except for that's never happened so as it turns out um in jewish law i'm talking about rabbinic law you're not you're not even eligible <clears throat> for the death penalty if that were even possible until you're at least 20 years old and I want to say that up front. That's a very, 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 very important um, statement to make. 
And it will help a lot of your Roman gospel friends when you tell them, look, according to rabbinic Jewish law, Fer hashtag Pharisees, which is, which is Judaism, which is the Judaism that Yeshua and the Talmudim practiced, <clears throat> you're not even eligible to even be considered for such an offense unless and until you're 20 years of age. Even though you become a man, as it were, at 13. So you see there's a seven-year, which is by no coincidence, a seven-year grace period of learning before you can even possibly be brought up on such charges. This is why it was um, the age of 20 years and up that the people were counted as part of the evil people that had to die in the wilderness. But also notice what it says. Well, I just got through talking about the value of, of men and women and their various roles, right? This only applied to males. This is the, the reason why, ladies and gentlemen, I say this over and over and over and over again. This is why we must embrace rabbinic literature. It is foolish not to. Because, A, you, you can't understand the Gospels without rabbinic literature. I'm just going to tell you that straight up. But you also lose a lot of this valuable information, such as, yep, everybody in the in the wilderness who was 20 years of age or up died. They didn't get the end of the promised land, but there were some exceptions. This is what it says in the Kale, Kale Tumash, except those under 20. So if you were under 20 years of age, you made it, okay? Unless you were a Levite. Why? Because the Levites did not enter into this uh, complaining. And it, and it goes on to say, and the women. What? Yeah, the, guess what? The women didn't complain either. Just like the women did not involve themselves in the sin of the golden calf. So you see, guys, you see that the responsibility we have? Um, we, this is why we need to be leading, right? Because, because uh, hear me out here. The people under 20 didn't do anything. The Levites didn't cause a problem. The women did not cause a problem. And he even says the mixed multitude, which is a lot of people. The, the converts did not cause a problem. They didn't die either. Okay. So who died? Jewish men. Well, we're all Jews. The, the, the mixed multitude are Jews as well, but I'm talking about the ones who are natural born Jews. What does this teach us overall, though? Just looking at this. Well, isn't it remarkable that all this suffering is going on? Now we are under this curse for 40 years because of something a bunch of guys did. Women didn't do it. The kids didn't do it. We did. What does this teach us as men? We've got to man up. We've got to lead. We've got to do right according to Torah as men. I'm talking to the men here, ladies, if you'll excuse me for a second. Um, we can't, guys, we can't rely on the women to lead us. Has, it's not sexist. It's not about that at all. We, it's not about that at all. It's, it's about the fact that we have a, we have a responsibility. And we're seeing here in Torah, remember, we're led by Torah, not pop culture. We're seeing here in Torah that the women could be doing great and we're not, and we still suffer. Whether you think that's fair or not, it really is, with all due respect, is irrelevant. What's relevant is the consequences of the actions. And so men, that we don't have the luxury of sitting back in our lawn chairs and being gildings and letting our wives just lead us. We have to lead. 
We have to take that responsibility. You understand what I mean? It's our duty, not theirs. And where I see our society get messed up a lot of times is when we get those, those things reversed. And women, you have to make a decision. Now, I'm not talking about, please don't misunderstand. This is not total submission to your husband, whatever he wants to do. Because if we're led by Torah. When your husband is off the Torah track, you're not following him from nowhere. So this is not, ladies, be submitted to your husbands. If your husband is a thug, you're not following him anywhere. Uh, no, you're the helper against him. So if he's off the path of Torah, you're supposed to be against him. That's what that means. What? I thought I was told that I was his slave and whatever he said, we were just going to do. No. This is when he's not when he's not doing right. You're supposed to be Own's wife. We'll get to that when we come to the Korok story for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. But you're supposed to be Own's wife. When Own is not doing right, his wife didn't just follow his lead. She didn't follow him to the human barbecue. She was like, um, excuse me, why are you being stupid? Because what you're doing is not in accordance with the law of Moses. And so I'm just saying, so guys, we have to lead, but yes, we have to lead from a Torah point of view. And if we're not leading from a Torah point of view, then our wives are supposed to be pushing against us. They're not going to just follow us. And when we lead them away from Torah and we look behind us and they're not there, uh, don't be surprised. Because they're not supposed to follow us just wherever we want to go. No. Am I making sense? Do you understand what I'm talking about here? I'm trying to bring some balance here. Because women have been taught that you're supposed to obey your husband in all things. When he gets off the der goes off the derrick and jumps off the proverbial cliff of stupidity, you're supposed to just follow him. No, you're not. No, you're not. So, um, guys, it's on us. Don't come to me crying when, you know, your wife is pushing against you because she, you know, she wants to be obedient to the word of God and you're wanting to go golf on Shabbat. Is this too, is this too tough? I tend to be more plain in my, and candid in my speaking. That's just, that's just my, that's my style. Some people don't like it and I get it because we, we don't, a lot of times people don't want, people don't, we don't like it when people are up, up front with us about facts and truth. We rather them like placate us. And I understand that, but I'm not into that. I don't have time for it. I, I want, and I, I'm the same way in my own life. I just, I want to hear the truth and move on. I don't have time for, you know, 10 years of games. Be a man, man up. Stop crying. Those are <laughs> these, these are all uh, these are all good uh, these are all good men things and women don't understand it. No, let him cry. Okay, and similar similarly, if you will enter the land that I swore I would settle you in, except Caleb and the son of Yefune. By the way, I cry. That was kind of a joke. Oh, I'm sorry. Any, any, a son of Yefune and Joshua, the son of Nun, it will be as if I do not live. As for your infants, whom you said will be taken captive as spoils, I will bring them there and they will come to know the land which you despise. So actually saving the kiddos was all part of the punishment because remember they, they accused God of saying our kids are going to be taken as spoils. And Hashem is now saying not only will your kids not be taken as spoils, but... Um, uh, but they're actually going to inherit the land. So this is all part of it. But as for you, your, your corpses will fall in the desert. Your children will wander in the desert with you for 40 years. Those of you who are 60 years old or older will die right now. Oh, yikes. The rest of those who are 20 years old or older at the incident of the golden calf will die at the age of 60. It will thus take 40 years for you to die out. And this way, your children will bear your guilt until the last of your corpses have fallen in the desert. So this really gives us a lot of backstory inside. If you were, if you happen to be 60 years of old or older, you died immediately at this. And every year, 
when everybody had their 60th birthday, whoever had their 60th birthday, they would die. And so the way that this went down is that um, every year on the 9th of Av, um, wherever the Israelites were in the desert, um, everybody would dig graves. If you were turning 60, if you're, you know, happy birthday to you, um, or you had turned 60 that year, then you would dig a grave for yourself and you would lay in it that night on the 9th of Av and um, you would die and everybody would bury you. So what happened on the last year, the 40th year, is this this happened and um, nobody died. And so the people remained every night. They would lay in those graves because they thought to themselves, well, maybe, maybe we miscalculated or something. It's not the 9th of Av. And so by the 15th of Av, Tuba Av, <clears throat> um, they realized that nobody had died. And they realized that the, the, the curse, if you will, had been lifted or the, or the last generation had, had passed away and so forth. And that's, that's when and why Tuba Av, the 15th of Av, became a celebration. Now, the story goes on that after... I'm just going to kind of cut to this right quick. The story goes on that after the people hear this edict, edict, they all of a sudden decided, no, no, let's go take the land. And um, there's an interesting insight about that where Moses tells them, look, you know, you're not going to succeed. You're not going to be successful. All of a sudden you want to change things. There's several reasons for this. Partly it's because our teshuva has to be sincere. This is not this was not sincere teshuva on their part. And our teshuva also has to be based not solely upon avoiding punishment, but also because we want to get right with God, because we we have a, a love of God and so forth. Now, having said that, listen, plenty of us make teshuva because of of, of punishment and so forth. It's kind of, you know, people say, oh, you're just saying that because you got in trouble. Well, frankly, that's not exactly abnormal. Having said that, though, if our teshuva is just because of that, like we really don't want to change, but we're just trying to head fake our way out of out of punishment, then no, the teshuva is not going to be effective. And that's what happens here. So it says in the insight, it will not succeed. Since these Jews had repented from the sin of the spies and now declared their readiness to ascend to the Holy Land, yet Moses told them that their endeavor would not be successful. Why? We know that nothing ever stands in the way of repentance. So, so why wouldn't they be? If they did make Teshuva, why didn't they? Well, here's the answer. This, or at least it's what the Keho Tumash brings down. It says, true, the land of Israel was promised to the Jewish people, and God had instructed them to conquer it, yet that could only be done if the ark and Moses led the way. Repentance could erase the sins of the people, but it could not change the procedure necessary to acquire the land. Since these people were unwilling to submit to Moses' leadership, and wanted to conquer the land on their own, their initiative was rejected. In other words, this is Teshuva without Torah. If you try to make Teshuva without Torah, you have not made Teshuva. This is a very, very critical statement that's being made here because a lot of people want to say, God, forgive me of my sins. I, re I repent of my sins. I want to move on from my sins. But they're not willing to put Torah in their life, and therefore their sins are not forgiven. Why? Why do you not forgive my sins if I don't take Torah? Guys, because breaking Torah is sinning. You, you can't, you can't, it's like the sages say, you can't go into the waters of the mikvah holding a serpent. Meaning you cannot go into the waters of the mikvah holding on to some demonic thing, some sinful thing. Well, you can't go to the waters of the mikvah and get immersed in water for the remission of your sins if you are doing so with the intentionality of not living a Torah life. That's kind of, it's silly. I mean, think about it. You're, the whole point of sin is I've been breaking Torah. So if I'm being a sinner means being a Torah breaker. That is biblically what it means. 
Therefore, if I want to cease being a sinner, then I naturally need to become Torah observant because that's what it means not to be a sinner. We know this already, but because of our theological brainwashing, we, we don't think about it. How do we know that Yeshua was not a sinner? Well, because he never broke the law of Moses. Okay. So because he never broke the law of Moses, he was sinless, which makes him a valid offering. Yeah, check. Well, are we supposed to be sinners? No. Well, what makes us sinners? Maybe, just maybe, the same thing that would make us a sinner is the same thing that would have made Yeshua a sinner, which means breaking the law of Moses. Yeah. So we're not supposed to be sinners, are we? Right. What does that mean? It means we're not supposed to break the law of Moses. Okay. Which means we're actually supposed to follow the law of Moses. Yeah. Why? Because we've been redeemed. Exactly. See, it's not complicated. But people complicate it. But God didn't. And so these people, the problem with them is they wanted to make Teshuva, but they still didn't want the law of Moses. And you can't do that. They did not want to submit to the law of Moses. <clears throat> the same is true in our daily life. And, or excuse me, the same is true in our day, it says. We'll conclude with this. However deserving we may may or may have may not be, there is a prescribed procedure for redemption as described by Mamanades, as Rambam. A king will arise from the house of David, learned in Torah and observant of the commandments, as was David his father, according to the teachings of the, of the written and oral Torah, and he will influence all of Israel to follow and strengthen it, and he will fight the wars of God, and he and he alone will build the temple in its proper place and gather the exiles of Israel and will rectify the entire world so that we all serve God together. You see, the true king, the true leader, has to be one who is doing so under the leadership of Torah observance. Torah observance. Well, men, this is our clue. A lot of today's discussion, of course, has been encouraging men to be men. Okay. We want to be stallions, not gildings. And so, men, we take our, our cue from, from biblical leaders. What made biblical leaders leaders? The answer is Torah. So you say, well, some men, you know, may wonder how to how to be a good leader for their for their family, for their wife, and and so forth. Listen, the the, the way in which you can be a, a good leader for your family is to be Torah true in every respect. That's how we form a minion. That's how we form a congregation. It's all based on Torah observance, and if and when. As men, we ever make mistakes, and it will happen, then we have to make teshuva back to Torah. End of our Aliyah today. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this program. Hopefully it's been educational, inspirational. And uh, for all of us guys, it's time to man up. We need good men, good, solid men. That's what we need, right? And so, uh, yeah, let's get into the fight, right? End of our Ali. I thank you so much for being here. Be sure and like this video, share it with all of your friends, subscribe to our channel. And we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow with God's help. Shalom Aleichem. <laughs>